Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. China shields Park terrorist Sajid Mir. Activists highlighting enforced disappearances in Balochistan. And Afghanistan witnessing spate of terror attacks. China has put a hold on a proposal by India and the US to designate Pakistan-based terrorist Sajid Mir as an international terrorist. Sajid Mir is a US-designated terrorist and the main hander of the 26-11 Mumbai attacks. China has put a hold on the Lashkar chief commander's UN terror designation after Islamabad detained and sentenced him for 15 years under terror financing charges earlier this year. China has consistently defended its client state Pakistan in the United Nations. The country, being the close ally of Islamabad, has always created hurdles for listing of known Pakistani terrorists. Recently, Beijing voted India in the United States bid to designate Pakistani terrorist Sajid Mir as the global terrorist under the 1,267 Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee. Mir is India's most wanted terrorist and the main handler of the 26-11 Mumbai attacks which shook the entire world. China has put a hold on the Lashkar chief commander's UN terror designation after Islamabad detained and sentenced him for 15 years under terror financing charges earlier this year. In June this year, Pakistan informed the global watchdog that Mir was arrested and given a 15 years prison term earlier this year, marking a turn around from the country's earlier claim that Sajid Mir had died some time ago. This development was reported only after Western countries mounted considerable pressure on Islamabad, which has been vying for an exit from the grey list of the Paris-based Financial Action Task Force to present proof of his purported demise. That China has been repeatedly shielding Pakistan, especially Pakistan-backed terrorists, from being listed as a global terrorist. What is new in this case is that this was a proposal that was basically moved by the United States. On the evidence that the FBI had, the United States moved this proposal, which was of course backed by India, and it is a United States proposal that China basically has struck down. Now, there are several things out here. Right now, United States has taken a particular stance on Taiwan, which China does not like. But this is entirely inconsistent with China's stand that it uses Pakistan as its proxy when it comes to disbalancing India. And indeed, uh, using terrorism as a tool to disbalance democracies, be it India, be it Western Europe, be it the United States. It's part of China's toolkit. Beijing going on by past pattern typically places a technical hold on India-related proposals at the 1,267 committee just before the deadline to raise objections to labs. Earlier in June this year, India and the US jointly proposed the listing of Abdul Rahman Makki, a close aide and brother-in-law of LAT founder Hafi Saeed at the UN Security Council. Both countries have already declared Makki as a terrorist under domestic laws and the US has offered a bounty of $2 million for him. But China blocked India's move at UN Security Council to shield Park-based terrorist Abdul Rahman Makki as a global terrorist by placing a technical hold on the proposal. China, to protect their favorite colony, Pakistan, has always kept doing this. It did the same thing with Jaish Muhammad chief Masood Azhar. New Delhi proposed sanctioning Masood Azhar in the year 2009, but it finally happened almost 10 years later in 2019. And during this time, Beijing kept blocking India's proposal. They delayed it as much as possible. 
Now Beijing is doing this all over again, this time with Sajid Mir. This is not a new thing. This started as early as 1979 when the, United, when the Soviet Union actually invaded Afghanistan. That time a lot of terrorists, militant organizations, people from Xinjiang were selected by the Chinese also to do jihad in, the, uh, in Afghanistan. This is something that does not people do not talk about. Pakistan's role was overt because a lot of um, uh, refugees came over to uh, Pakistan and that time there was some sort of a moral justification in some quarters for Pakistan to do something in Afghanistan. Pakistan anti-terror campaign is a farce. It is designed to give the impression of progress, but behind the scenes, nothing has changed. According to US congressional report, Pakistan is home to 12 foreign terror organizations, five being India-centric, including Lashkar-e-Taiba and Jaish-e-Mohammed Hezbul Mujahideen. US officials have also identified Pakistan as a base of operations for numerous armed and non-state terrorist groups, some of which have existed since the 1980s. The question is, will the international community call out this farce? Let's turn our attention to Afghanistan where the intensified efforts are fueling concern that the country might again become a hub of instability across South Asia and beyond. The war-torn country has been witnessing spate of attacks in the past few months. Scores of Afghan civilians have been killed in bomb blasts, some of which have been claimed by the Islamic State. On September 21st, another attack strikes the country, this time in a restaurant in Afghan capital. At least three people have been killed and 13 injured in the explosion. Since the Taliban group took power in Afghanistan last year, a string of deadly bombings and a number of violent attacks have convulsed the country. On September 21st, an explosion occurred in the capital city of Afghanistan. At least three people have been killed and 13 injured in the blast. The blast took place in a restaurant in the city's western Dehmazang neighborhood. A police team also arrived in the area to find out the cause of the blast, whether it was an accident or the result of an attack. Unverified images on social media appear to show a number of bloody corpses lying amid a scene of devastation outside the restaurant in the Afghan city. No group has yet claimed responsibility for the deadly explosion. Look, I have always maintained these guerrilla organizations, these terrorists and insurgent groups, they can bring anyone on knees, especially any state, I would say. Especially when they have no ethic, they can uh, kill, attack and target civilians. So they can create difficulty, but they have absolutely no experience of providing governance, number one. And when you're providing governance, you need an infrastructure. So they don't have. So they are someone who are very adept at attacking not defending, not protecting, not providing governance, not incorporating people in a participative kind of governance. So it is beyond capacity of uh, Taliban to provide security to uh, Afghanistan. The war-torn country has witnessed a series of attacks staged by the Islamic State in the past few months. Just a few days ago, Islamic State group targeted the Russian embassy in Kabul. At least eight people got killed in the suicide bombing. According to sources, the bomber detonated the explosive near the entrance of the building in the southwestern part of the capital. Two members of the embassy staff are among the dead and as many as 15 others were injured. Islamic State has emerged as the most potent enemy of the Taliban. The two groups are now engaged in a murky and a bloody battle. The security situation in the country, which had improved after the end of fighting following the Taliban takeover, is seen to be deteriorating. 
ISIS has been a very funny question uh, because you know the thing is uh, the Pakistanis say that ISIS uh, in Afghanistan and Kashmir is an Indian plant and they're somehow raw agents. Why? Because they don't really want to touch them. The reality is we know that every terror organization there except for the leadership, the actual membership is fungible. You go from one terror organization to another. It's a bit like a student who gets rusticated from one school who jumps to the next school and then gets rusticated from there and jumps to the next school. It's a veritable menagerie of terrorism. So um, ISIS, what is ISIS going to do? Well, you know, in, 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 the, in terms of the Middle East, what the ISIS did was very novel and shocking. In terms of Afghanistan, there's nothing left to be novel and shocking anymore. And they're just part, they're just one more group of the kind of word soup that uh, Pakistan likes to play. And essentially what Pakistan is doing is they're showing the Haqqanis, hey, if you don't comply and behave as supplicant as you used to, we have this new kid on the block. Afghanistan is constantly threatened by terrorism and at the same time the Taliban have hampered the country's freedom. The country is in the midst of a severe economic and humanitarian catastrophe. Where previously there was hope with women playing a key role in society, there is now starvation, destitution and violence. It is so difficult to imagine how much has changed for so many in such a short period of time. The people of Afghanistan had hope for peace and an end to wars to better their lot, but not at the expense of the past 20 years worth of accomplishments. Afghanistan's seemingly endless war appears to be far from over. Balochistan, the largest and the resource-rich province, is plagued by rampant human rights violations, including arbitrary detentions, enforced disappearances and brutal killings. Over the years, the Baloch are being murdered by Pakistani security forces with a motive to suppress their voices of freedom. Several human rights activists and people belonging to Baloch community staying abroad are demanding intervention by the international community to protect the civilian rights in the province. A report. Enforced disappearances have been a long stain on Pakistan's human rights record. Despite the pledges of successive governments to criminalize the practice, there has been a very slow movement on legislation, which is equal to nothing. While people continue to be tortured, killed and forcibly disappeared with impunity. The issue has been raised during the 51st regular session of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. Enforced disappearances continue to be a major political issue in Central and South Asia. In its most recent report, the Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances paints the image of a region in which state-induced deaths and disappearances remain a sad and avoidable political reality. The case of Pakistan is particularly concerning. Pakistan has not just failed to effectively criminalize the enforced disappearances, but has also failed to collaborate with relevant UN bodies and investigations. The use of enforced disappearance by Pakistani security agents continues to play a significant part in their attempt to quell Baloch self-determination and constitutes a major human rights violation against the people of Balochistan. According to recent figures released by the Commission of Inquiry on Enforced Disappearances in July 2022, a total of 8,696 missing person cases have been reported, while 6,513 of these cases have been solved. 2,219 are still pending. Demonstrations against targeted killings and fake encounters are often held in Balochistan and other parts of the world. While holding placards and banners chanting slogans against inhuman atrocities in Pakistan, they urge the international community to speak out against the genocide as the silence of the world community is giving impunity to Pakistan. On the occasion of its 51st session Human Rights Commission in Geneva, Baloch Voice Association 
an NGO based in Paris, also organized a three-day banner and poster exhibition about the enforced disappearances in Balochistan. I want to ask the United Nations what are their views on that? Why are they silent of the genocide happening in Balochistan? Why don't they take a view on what is the Pakistan military doing in Balochistan? While thousands of Baloch have been abducted and disappeared since its illegal occupation, hundreds of others have been eliminated in the line of Pakistan's kill and dump policy. It is a tool by the Pakistani state to silence the oppressed people of the poor province. Families of the disappeared people suffer significant harm. They live with continuous uncertainty about the fate or whereabouts of their loved ones. Some of these missing persons relatives have passed away with the pain and suffering in their chests, but their loved ones have never returned back to them and they died waiting. The terror factory is located in Pakistan and along the line of control in Pakistan occupied Kashmir are continuing to push in terrorists into Jammu and Kashmir. The purpose is to unleash violence in the Union territory at the behest of the Pakistani army and spy agency, the ISI. However, the Indian security forces are vigilant enough to give them a befitting reply. A report. Pakistan has been accused of sheltering terrorists for years in its territory and its occupied region. Reports suggest that more than 20 terrorist training camps are operating in the country and Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Author Roland Jacker write in its Global Watch analysis that Pakistan Inter-Services Intelligence continues to support the proxy war in Jammu and Kashmir by aiding and abetting terrorism through terrorist outfits including the Lashkar-e-Taiba, jaish e mohammad and Hezbollah Mujahideen. As per reports, the infrastructure to recruit, train and infiltrate terrorists into Jammu and Kashmir remains intact in Pakistan. Pakistan has left no stone unturned to create mayhem in India, whether be it supporting the militancy in Jammu and Kashmir or militancy in Punjab. They, at the smallest opportunity, try to create mayhem in India and leave no stone unturned to bleed India. For the Indian soldiers at this frontier, it's a battle that has to be fought on two fronts, hostile neighbour and harsh winter, which is approaching. While the infiltration has remained largely under control this year, the possibility of Pakistan would return its old ways of making increased attempts to sneak more terrorists ahead of the winter. Besides infiltration of terrorists, the Indian Army is also worried about the flow of drugs from across the border. As per the Ministry of Home Affairs, there has been more than 75% decrease in net infiltration from across the border between 2018 and 2021 and more than 80% reduction in the number of terrorist incidents during the same period. Despite such efforts by the security forces in eliminating those infiltrating the line of control, the drug menace has not abated. In order to target youths and channeling finance for Pakistan-backed terror activities, Islamabad is using narco-terrorism as a new weapon in its proxy war against India in the Kashmir Valley. Pakistan's formal economy is in a poor state. Everyone knows that the narco money is being used to fund the terrorists as well as to generate money through irregular means. And therefore, with Haqqani in the government in Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan finds that this is a lucrative trade and therefore the drug cartels are trying every possible means to send the narcotics into India and create a market and also spoil the new generation. Pakistan's efforts to undermine normalcy in Jammu and Kashmir 
particularly after the August 2019 constitutional reforms, is rooted in its decades-long proxy war against India. Islamabad should now understand that any attempt to challenge India's integrity will be disastrous for it. It needs to make a hard choice now, find peace with India, a blunder into an escalatory cycle. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa.nin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.